Yes, I can hear you. Great. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody out there on the internet to today's class of computational thinking. A uh, quick announcement for the MIT folks that uh, starting on Wednesday, we're going to switch from Zoom to StreamYard and there'll be instructions on Piazza and in Canvas on how that will work. So we believe that'll work better in a certain ways. So we'll give it a try. Uh, so today we'll be on Zoom and on Wednesday we will be on StreamYard. So today's lecture is going to be a, a data science lecture continuing with our second module. And we're going to um, try to understand these uh, statistics. So, some of you may know, you may have, may have run these uh, statistical packages or on a calculator, uh, on a computer, you get these you get these tables out there. And if you've ever done that, you might have wondered what it really means. It can be very confusing when you first start out. And one way to kind of really get a grasp of, of what these uh, statistical packages are doing is to kind of run an artificial simulation yourself. And um, when you're able to, to run a simulation very, very fast, you, we can get a lot of data and we can really get to understand it. So what do I mean by all this? Well, let me take a very simple set of data. Um, so what I'd like to do is simply grab some Fahrenheit and Celsius data. So I could change the number of data points. Here's 10 data points. We can make it 100 data points. Um, probably 10 will do for starters. So let's just take 10 data points. And what I'm going to do is in my x here, I'm just going to take a bunch of random numbers between minus 10 and 100. So that'll be my, the, the x axis will just be some Fahrenheit. And the y axis will be some Celsius numbers. And so the, the standard formula to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius is to take 5 ninths times the Fahrenheit and subtract um, what might look like a funny number, 17.777, but it's really just 5 ninths times 32, which might look like familiar numbers. Okay, and so we could do this a bunch of different times. We'll get different data. Uh, I'm actually listing the data here in a matrix format just below at the bottom of my screen. So here, we'll just pick one here. It doesn't really matter which one. Okay, and so this is some data that we have. Okay, and now the first thing I wanna show you is uh, how one can organize data with labels. And so Julia has the concept of a data frame, which, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, which originally started out in the R statistics language. Okay, and it's it compatible also with like Python tables and so forth. So here, let me show you how you build a data frame. Okay, and so with the data frames package, it's quite easy. All you have to do is, uh, you have this constructor, this data frame constructor, which basically says label equals vector, right? So we have the degrees Fahrenheit equals X, degrees centigrade equals Y. And you see that a data frame is really nothing but the same matrix that we had over here. It's very, you know, it looks a lot like this matrix, except that it has, the columns are labeled, right? We have Fahrenheit and centigrade, while matrices we think of as unlabeled, right? I mean, you have a row index and a column index, but other than that, you don't get to sort of label it, you know, red, green, blue, or Fahrenheit centigrade, or, uh, and so sometimes when you're handling data, labels are very, very important. So here data is Fahrenheit and centigrade. And the other thing you can notice that for a data frame, columns can have different types. So here in this array, everything's a float 64. The integers that were on the x-axis got converted to float 64s. Here, the Fahrenheit remains integers the centigrade is float 64. So you can have different types um, and that could be handy. Okay, so, uh, so that's a data frame. Um, you could build a data frame straight out of a matrix. You could take the matrix X, Y, like I had over here, right? This is the matrix X, Y. You could take a data frame of X, Y, which will convert it to a data frame. You could add the columns later, if you like. I could rename the columns from some default to be Fahrenheit and centigrade. But you'll see that if you do that, uh, of course, they'll both be float 64s, which explains why this data is formatted a little differently. It's got the dot zeros, right? So probably that's not as desirable as just sort of listing each column separately, okay? So uh, uh, of course you can also convert back uh, to go the other way. If I've got this data frame and I wanna convert it back into a matrix, all I have to do is uh, 
is is use the the type constructor you know for matrix and that will convert us back we we will lose the label information but at least you can if you if you want to if you have some other program that only handles matrices and doesn't handle data frames then at least this will work okay so i've already mentioned this comment about types so if you're handling data the simplest sort of thing that you might want to be able to do is read and write it to a file right and so uh, let's go ahead and write this data to a file. So uh, here, this, this one here will actually write it to a file called testcfvwrite. And so I can actually look at it here on my Mac, TSWrite and open it up with some Mac spreadsheet-like program. And here you see that I get the very same data uh, in this spreadsheet, right? Or if I, if I had a lot more data, if you want, it would be no problem. Suppose I had a hundred and I uh, and I use the the CSV dot, dot write, which is from the CSV dot JL package. Then we can take a look at it here, and you can see I get uh, I've got a hundred items. There they are, from one through a hundred. The very same items that were in Julia are now in a spreadsheet. Right, uh, this is a Mac program. It's sort of like uh, other spreadsheet programs like Excel and Google Sheets. Uh, but the point is it's just a, a comma separated value file, like any kind. All right, let's go back to 10 again. I don't know why, but let's just play with 10 points. Okay, so there's that. And uh, and once it's written, of course, we there's a, there, here's the data. Um, we can actually read it. I'll call it data again. And this brings it back from the file into a data frame. Okay. So, um, and I should mention that if you want to sort of grab the first column, uh, you can, you can uh, either reference it by indexing the degree F column. So you can do it by label or you can do it by the position. So the second column, right? Or if, this uh, this is the first column, I should say. Let's do the first column, right? So I could do it by label or by column, All right? So the reason I'm showing this to you is uh, is is that very often you're going to have data in some format in some file, and you're going to want to bring it in as a data frame. And so this is this is one of many many ways in Julia that you can do it. This is one common way to just bring the data in so you can start playing with it. Okay. Well, now that we have the data, what I want to do is talk about these statistics simulations. And so what I'm going to do is take the Fahrenheit and centigrade data and make it noisy. Okay, I'm going to, I'm actually going to, to noisify it, if you will. Um, I'm going to add some random noise to the original data to simulate a kind of experiment. I don't know whether Fahrenheit and centigrade is sort of the, the best world analogy, but it'll do. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add noise, right? So here I'm going to play with lots of different noise of different at different levels. Okay, here let's I'm going to keep it relatively small for starters. Here, let, whoops, let me just grab it, set it down. I think I moved the slider a few too many times, but here let's add just a little bit of noise, and you can see here. Let's close this up for a second so we can see what's going on. So you can see that if you look at the if, if you look at the table here, you can see that I've got noise at different levels. Okay, so just playing with the noise, adding it, and in the picture below, it, we don't really need to see this. So here, let's just look at it like this. Uh, in the picture below, I have the 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 red line is the theoretical line that converts Fahrenheit to Celsius. Okay, so you can see that zero degrees. Celsius goes down to 32 Fahrenheit and so forth. Okay, so this is the, the theoretical line. And uh, here I plot in, with these red dots, the noisy data. And I also made the best fit line, the least squares line that fits through this data. And so if I had very little noise, it all lines up. And you could see that um, every time I kind of, you know, click with my fingers, we get a different data set, even at the same level of noise. So what I really want you to think about is we've run an experiment, right? We're running an experiment, we're measuring temperature, and we have a thermometer that's maybe not so accurate, okay? So there's 
there's noise in the measurement uh, of, 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 of your data, which is very, very typical in the world. And so you end up with getting a, uh, your line is not the true answer. If the noise is little, hopefully it'll be near the answer. If I start adding more noise, you can see that things bounce around a lot and you're gonna get different answers. So, so much of statistics, so much of elementary statistics, when you get into the, you know, your first class in statistics, it's all about what to do given this sort of situation. So let me repeat myself because this is kind of important. You run some sort of experiment in the real world and you don't get exactly what you learn in sort of a theoretical class, right? Because the real world is filled with noise. And so every time you do an experiment, you get noisy data, you don't get real data, and you can fit it in this case with a line, in other cases you could fit it with other kinds of curves, okay? And every time you do this, you get a different line, okay? And so here I am, I measured 10 points and I got a line, okay? I'll do it again, I get two, two 10 different points and a different line, right? And so every time you do this, you're going to get a different answer. And the real question in statistics is, Given that you're in this situation, you've measured 10 points, say, what can we say about the answer? How good is the answer? How much confidence should we have in this straight line? Right? And so that's what you do in a statistics class. Uh, by the way, in a linear algebra class, maybe in other, and, and perhaps in other classes as well, you learn how to fit the blue line, right? You'll get that best fit line. That's standard practice, for example, in MIT's linear algebra class. Um, it probably happens in other classes as well. But what you won't see in a, in a linear algebra class is how to interpret the errors that you have, right? And that, that's very much the world of statistics to figure out, you know, what are, what are these errors? You know, the fact that you're off from that line, what will that tell you, okay? So if you have ever done any of this sort of statistics things, you'll see that you get these kind of mysterious tables. Okay, and so here I'm gonna produce a mysterious table and I'm, by the end of this lecture, you're going to understand what all these columns and numbers mean. But you know, these, these, these tables always seem sort of mysterious to me and that's, that's why I'm calling it a mysterious table uh, because in part, I don't know how these numbers are calculated. Well, now I do and you will know as well. And in part, because it's hard to keep straight what are the assumptions that, that like, why is this the table that's, forget about how these numbers are calculated for a second. Why is this the table that, that everybody is, is using, right? What, what is it about this? You know, these are like analysis of variance, ANOVA, maybe you've heard these terms. Um, what is it that, that makes this so interesting to a statistician? Okay, and so that's what I would like to show you. And we're going to use uh, the fact that we can do, we can do a simulation. We could pretend, you know, we have a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million experiments where we we have noise in the world and we get some data and we see what happens. And so we can actually simulate all the assumptions that are behind the table like this. Okay. So first of all, to kind of get things started, let me point out that we're going to use the noisy data, the very same here. Let's put it back over here so you can see it, all right? The, no the noisy data is exactly that, that data frame that we saw before. It's, it's a table of 10 Fahrenheit's and 10 centigrades that come with noise, okay? So it's 10 Fahrenheit's and 10 centigrades that are not quite the exact answer. It's a noisy version of the exact answer, okay? And uh, what we're going to get back is information as to what the best fit line is and how much confidence we're going to have in it. So that's what we're gonna do, we're going to explain this. So let's start by talking about regression. Okay, so regression, by the way, is, uh, is, is a terrible word. It doesn't even mean what it sounds like. I have here a, a link if you, wanna, if you wanna see it yourselves as to why is it called regression anyway. Um, it does seem like the word should be updated, but it's probably too late for that. So here you could you could read about uh, Galton's use of the word regression and where it came from. Uh, I've heard people say things like, you know, I've heard these phrases like, oh, machine learning is just fancy regression. 
And I always I find such phrases mysterious, or at least I did at first, because to me, machine learning is about like figuring out something you don't know. And regression, as it's used in statistics, it's about fitting a line. And at first it sounds like they have nothing to do with each other. But then you realize that what machine learning is all about is fitting parameters to a model. And here you're going to see that you know, linear regression is just that your model is that you have a slope and an intercept and you're trying to find the best ones. And really that's what machine learning is all about. You've got lots of parameters and you're just trying to find the best ones to fit the data you have. Um, so that's why people say that, that, that machine learning is just big fancy regression. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk a little bit about fitting these lines. So you saw that I've got a bunch of data points. These, these red dots are exactly the data points you see in this table, right? You could see there's a data point at minus two, another one at 19, right? At 25 and so forth. So this data here is exactly what you see in the red dots, okay? And this blue line got computed somehow, you'll see in a second how, is the best fit line in the following sense. Of all the lines that you can have, you can drop the perpendiculars, the verticals, and you can sum up the squares of these distances. And this blue line here is the one that gives you the minimum of that sum of squares, right? So the best fit line is the one that in some sense kind of minimizes all the possible vertical distances. And if you ask why squares and not absolute values, the answer is that, uh, to be honest, the square, to minimize the sum of the squares is easier to calculate than the sum of the absolute values. It was the sort of thing that people could do with pencil and paper back in the old days. And so the squares kind of became the easy one to fit. It has nice theoretical properties. You could minimize the sums of the absolute values. I mean, on a computer, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But as far as I could tell, it doesn't happen as much as the sums of the squares. But there are other metrics you can use too. Some of the squares is still the classic. So you might ask, how did I get this blue line? I mean, to specify this blue line, what I would need is a slope and an intercept. And I'm just gonna sort of throw a few formulas out, uh, but not, I don't really wanna go into too much detail. The first formula is, uh, is, is a linear algebra solution. Uh, so I'm calling this data here X and this data here now I'm calling it YY. Here I can, let me annotate a little bit here just to keep it straight. So I just wanted X and something that looked like a Y. The, the original data, the non-noisy data was Y. The noisy data I'm calling YY. I chose these letters because I kind of think that X often looks like an independent variable and Y as a dependent variable. Like, y is a function of x typically in mathematics. So I thought it'd be easier if I just used the notation of x and, and something that looked like a y. Uh, so what you do is you, uh, is you create a certain matrix that has x down the second column and ones down the first column, right? And then you do a least square solution with the y. And that actually gives you the the slope and the intercept. And many of you will or have learned this in maybe a linear algebra class. You'll, you'll see a formula like this for, uh, for calculating the, the slope and the intercept. And so this is the linear algebra formula, which gives you um, the answer for the, it's actually the intercept and then the slope, right? I'm using the, the high school notation of B for intercept and M for slope. And uh, if you look at these numbers like minus 18.3221, you'll see, oh, minus 18.3221, that's that very number over there, okay? Or 0.534 is the slope, and you'll see that is the very number that's being computed in this table, okay? So the, the first column is just the intercept and the slope given the data that you have. Um, if you haven't seen the linear algebra formula, there's a sort of more basic formula which gives exactly the same answer. Um, so all you have to do is plug in your, your X data and your Y dependent data. And uh, it's, it's really simple. N is how much data you have. X zero is the demean, D means, right? We remove the mean X. Y zero is the D means Y. Okay, and then we're gonna get an estimator for the slope. And so I'll call it M estimate, M for slope and E for estimate. Uh, and it's simply, for those of you who know, it's the dot product of, of the D mean X and the D means Y divided by the sum of the squares. Uh, I mean, this is easy to see. Um, 
the intercept, it's easy to understand the, uh, the, how to use the formula. Exactly why this formula works is not something I'm going to do today. It's not hard to explain, but we're not going to do that today. B, the intercept is, is uh, maybe the, once you have the slope, you could see the intercept is, is, is the point on the line which has the mean of x and the mean of y. So this formula, I think, is easy to understand, right? It says that, that the intercept plus the mean times the mean, the, the slope times the mean of x is the mean of y. Okay, and then um, I'm going to throw in a noise estimate, which is the sum of squares uh, divided by n minus 2 for various reasons. Okay, and so here you'll see I get the same number. The B estimate is the same number computed by linear algebra. The M estimate is the same number computed by the linear algebra formula. And we, in addition here, have one more number, which is a kind of, uh, is, 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 is some sort of estimate for, for the variance actually of the noise. Uh, you see, this is kind of a cool thing actually, because you run an experiment and you measure and then you fit the line. And you see the real world doesn't tell you what the, the, the noise is, but you can actually estimate the, the, the size of the noise. And this is how we do that. Okay, so let's kind of bring it all together with the word model. Okay, so statisticians say we have a model. Okay, and even the word model, I think is takes a little bit of discussion as to what do we mean by a model? Like what, what, what are we modeling? What, what are the assumptions? Um, what do you have? What do you guess at? It gets a little bit tricky. So in the case of a linear model, what are we going to assume? Well, in this, for this lecture, I mean, you could do whatever you want. There are a lot of other things you could do. In this lecture, we're gonna assume a linear model with standard normal noise, okay? And so the model is gonna be that our, our, our independent data is X, our dependent data is Y, and we're gonna assume that the way Y gets generated in the real world is that Y will be MX plus B, right? It'll be a linear function of X plus random noise that has, in our case, it's gonna have mean zero and variance sigma squared, right? So the same, you could change this, but for now we're gonna assume that the noise is for every variable is the same, okay? So what that means is whatever it is you're measuring, whether it's it's temperatures or heights or, or IQs or anything out there that you might be measuring, we're gonna assume that somewhere out there in the real world, there's an intercept B, a slope M and a sigma, and you don't know them, right? The word model says that they exist, there, but you don't know them, that, that the real world is built this way and, the way I like to say it is the X data is known and we're gonna make the measurement, so we're gonna get Y. And every time we make that measurement, that measurement's gonna be noisy. But we know that the world, the assumption of the world that we're going to have is that that noise is a standard normal. And when I do it many, many times and at different places, I still will get the same variance. Now, again, you don't have to make that assumption um, but this is sort of the standard linear model. That is the assumption of the linear model, okay? So you've got this model and then you go out there and you get some data, right? So we have, an, we have data points on a in a vector X and a Y. Um, and from that data, we can get, we don't, we don't calculate the true B as you saw, but we will get an estimate for the intercept, the estimate for the slope and in my code I showed you just before, the, the code was right up here, you also have an estimate for sigma that comes out, okay? So uh, it's an estimate. And if you ran this many, many times, you would get different estimates, okay? So, so a statistician would, would, would say that these are estimates based on your data points. If you ran the experiment again, you'd get different data points. And I'd like to do, I'd like to do this in Julia. I'd like to run this many, many times. So we could actually see how good this is. How good are these estimates, All right? So that's what we're about to do. But let me make clear in this model, there really are three kinds of variables. I feel that, the, that it's worth distinguishing three kinds of variables. There, the model variables, B, M, and Sigma, which are unknown. And I guess in the end, they remain unknown. You might have estimates for them, but in the end, these variables are unknown. There's the predictive variable X, 
that's considered fixed and known. And then there's the response variable y, which is noisy. Okay, so that's the kinds of variables that we have. Okay, uh, going back to this table here, then this table is built from, in, in this case, 10 data points. Okay, so we, we have 10 noisy data points and we've got this particular table. So first of all, you even this looks a little mysterious. So let me explain this. This, this little bit of output over here might look a little bit uh, interesting. And what, what this means, this is sort of a statistical notation. It means that the Celsius value, we're calling it Y, is going to be dependent on on, 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 well, there's going, there, it's good. It, this is sort of funny, but it's going to be some coefficient times one plus another coefficient times the Fahrenheit number, right? It's like a linear combination of, of one and the Fahrenheit, okay? And so um, this is saying that we're going to, we're going to tell you what these coefficients are. So just, it might be helpful to, to kind of show you a generalization of this notation. If a statistician said that y is, you know, related to or twiddles uh, one and x one and x two and x three, it's really a shorthand for saying that y is some constant plus another constant x one and another times x two plus another times x three. Okay, and so we're assuming these are the these are the variables that this depends on. And now what we're going to do is actually do some sort of statistical test to see whether we believe this or not, whether, whether this is truly dependent on this or not. Okay. But before we do that, let me do what I promised I would do and run many, many, many simulations. Okay. I want to simulate the real world by running many, many noisy values. Okay. So I've got my little simulator here. And all I'm going to do, I mean, I was playing with other distributions, but all I'm going to do is take my Fahrenheit data and I'm going to do what I believe the real world does. I am going to add random noise to my true answer. And then I'm going to estimate using the, the code that I had right over here, this code right here, I'm going to estimate many, many times the intercept the slope and the noise, okay? I'm actually gonna do this 100,000 times, okay? And just mentioning that uh, uh, since this is hard to read and Julia can't do this with a comma because it would get confused with tuples, um, we use underscore to, which almost as easy to read as a comma. So just mentioning that as a digit separator. But here we go, let me go S is, let me do a simulation, all right? so. Remind you, let me remind you that when I do when I do the simulation, I'm gonna get oh the guy spell length right. When I do the simulation, I'm going to get a hundred thousand answers and let's see what they all look like. Let's grab the first one. The first one is three numbers. Okay, and I'm just gonna remind you that this is the first simulation, and we're going to get the intercept, the slope, and uh, the 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 estimation of the noise. of the noise sigma, right? So, and every one of these are going to do this, right? I'm gonna do this 100,000 times, right? I'll, here's the second one, here's the third one, right? So I'm going to do this. So, and I'm going to, to plot this. So here, let's do this for different sigmas just to, to see what happens. So you see, let me, let me say something very clearly. Getting data is normally a very expensive proposition. Right? I mean, here I am with each simulation, I'm getting 10 data points measured off my Fahrenheit Celsius curve, right? And I'm getting these 10 data points 100,000 times. In the real world, it's usually really hard to run an experiment 100,000 times, right? But this is a computer and I can, I could simulate running an experiment 100,000 times. And I've got the benefit of knowing the truth. I know exactly the theoretical Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion. Okay, so I can do that. By the way, can I get a quick sound check again just to be sure everything's okay? Dave, everybody can hear me? Yeah, everything's fine. 
<laughs> all right, cool. All right, just like to be sure. Okay, so uh, we can, you saw I added noise. I could add just a little bit of noise uh, or I could add a lot more noise. And each time I run 10 data points and I calculate an intercept, I get an answer. And you remember the, the actual true answer is at minus 17.7777. It's at this white line, right? That's the true value of the intercept from Fahrenheit to centigrade, right? That's the true value where centigrade is zero, right? Fahrenheit is minus 17.777. So, uh, uh, or did I say that backwards? I always got confused. But anyway, uh, uh, let's see, how does it work? When, when, when centigrade is zero, Fahrenheit is 30. Two, uh, and when Fahrenheit is zero, centigrade. No, I said it right. Centigrade is minus seventeen point seven seven seven. Yeah. So there's minus seventeen point seven 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 right there. Uh, and interestingly enough, when I go and run this sort of noisy experiment, it looks like the the these different intercepts that I get themselves form on a normal distribution, and that is something that statisticians discovered probably like more than a century ago, I'm sure, maybe even a couple centuries ago. That's exactly what happens, that this will be a normal distribution and it will be centered exactly on the true mean, right at minus 17.777. So uh, instead of just asserting it on like a blackboard with Julia, I was able to, to do this simulation 100,000 times, pretending, and you could see that, well, we may not get the true intercept exactly. We may be too small, we may be too high, but at least that it is centered on what is the true intercept. Okay, so uh, here you could see, I actually computed to a few more places. And so the true intercept is the second number, 777. Um, here's the first one. This is, uh, it's pretty close, right? Four decimal places or so. Um, it, it worked out, you know, with 100,000 data points, it's not hard. So, uh, you could see that this assumption that while the inter any one intercept based on 10 points may be wrong, on average, it will be right. Uh, interestingly enough, we could also compute the standard deviation of the intercept since we have 100,000 numbers. And uh, I can tell you that statisticians know an exact formula for the theoretical standard deviation of what it'll be. Um, and so I'm just gonna type this formula without proof right now. This is the theoretical standard deviation, not the empirical one. This is the one that the math promises. And you can see, you know, two decimal places on that one, but 0.49, I guess, and 0.49 is the sample standard deviation. Okay, and so that's pretty good. But then there, that, that's the intercept. What about the slopes? Okay, so just to show you where I am in the, today's lecture, um, we did the intercepts. What about the slopes? Okay, well, if you do the slopes, and I think that, uh, I don't need the legend here, so let's just turn that off. Um, so the slopes also seem to have a normal distribution. The true slope is 5 ninths or 0.555, and so that's what I have in the middle. But if again, you may be off because after all, the real world is noisy. What's really happening here is that you're seeing that the real world is noisy, but in a sort of structured sort of way. Okay, and again, I could change the sigma. We can make it smaller or bigger, and that'll right. That'll narrow it down. Right. The the lesser the variance, you know, the closer to sort of the theoretical number an experiment will have. Okay. So you know this. What this does is put structure on noise. That it's not just sloppy noise like you know, you sometimes might imagine, but this noise has very, very careful structure uh, by assumption. And so that's what's happening. And so the, the sample mean, we could take a look at it. Um, the mean that we got, so the true, the true slope is five ninths or, you know, 0. 0.5555 like that. Um, and look at as many decimal places for the slope, right? We get a lot of decimal places for the sample mean when we ran the experiment a hundred thousand times. Okay, and again, the standard deviation is a formula we know. Here's the standard, standard, and here is the true theoretical answer, since I know the exact sigma. Uh, and you could see that even this is giving you like three places. Okay, so uh, now the next thing I want to do is see if we can actually estimate sigma, the noise we added. 
Remember, I deliberately added sigma, but the person who does the 10 experiments that gets the 10 data points, they don't know sigma, only I know it. So, uh, but we're, we're trying to simulate it. And here we go, we actually get this. Yeah, let's make the legend equals false. And you'll notice that the distribution of the estimated standard deviation is not normal anymore, right? It's a normal distribution is symmetric. This thing's got this long tail going on, right? This is not, this distribution of sigmas, well, I mean, for starters, standard deviation is always positive, right? And so it couldn't be normal, I guess, because, I mean, just, just because normal distribution is allowed to be positive and negative on the whole real line. Uh, but you, you do get some other thing, and this, this is what you get. And uh, the mean is kind of, I mean, for a distribution like this, maybe you think the mean ought to be like where the maximum is. But then when you think about it, you realize that there's kind of a lot going on to the right with the whole tail. And so that kind of shifts, shifts the mean a bit to the right of, of the location of the maximum. And so this white line here is exactly the true, uh, is, is the true minimum, okay? And uh, the other thing I should mention here is I actually divided uh, in a way to make the variance exactly one, I normalized it. Um, and when you do that, you get another distribution. This is where the sort of famous chi-squared distribution, in our case with n minus two degrees of freedom, okay? And so, uh, but, once again, statisticians know exactly how far off your estimate is for the noise, right? And so remember, every time we get 10 data points, we compute an estimate for the noise. And uh, if you did this 100,000 times, you would get lots and lots of different answers. Um, but we know how that's going to be distributed. Then we know the mean. And here you could see that um, the mean, here it is, 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 this is the sample mean. Right, and here's the true variance that I gave to the, to, and you can see it's again about three decimal places, okay? And so, uh, uh, oh, and, and this, the same thing for the standard deviation of, of so, so let me say this very clearly, we have our estimates of the noise and we have 100,000 of them. And so we could take also the standard deviation and here is, uh, the true answer. And again, you get three decimal places when you run so many cases. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so so to repeat, let me remind you what, let me kind of catch everybody up in case you missed it. What we've been doing, let's go back to the beginning, just to kind of sum things up a little bit, is we've been grabbing, we think of an experiment as going out there and grabbing 10 exact Fahrenheit numbers and 10 noisy centigrade numbers, okay? And I get to control the noise, right? I've got a little slider, uh, which here's my noise slider, right? I've got a little slider, which lets me control. I, if I go too much, it looks too weird. So here, let's, I've got a little slider. And maybe what would be good now is Let's actually look, take a closer look at this table. So when my noise is zero, the coefficients are exactly what we know them to be, right? The, the, the five ninths is the slope between centigrade and Fahrenheit and minus 17.777 is the exact Celsius when Fahrenheit is zero. Okay, so, uh, but now, no, let, let's, let's look at a few, let's watch the numbers change as we add a little bit. Well, first of all, when we add a little bit of noise, here, let's not go too far at first. When we add a little bit of noise, let's go back down just a little bit of noise. Well, first of all, we only have 10 data points. And so these numbers start to change, okay? But our noise is small. And you could see that whatever this thing is, it gets, let, let's take a look at this number here, the standard error, it gets somewhat bigger when I add more noise, as I move to the right, you see it's getting bigger. When I move to the left, it's getting smaller. So somehow this is measuring the noise and the coefficients, okay? And let's look at these T numbers. They go the opposite way, right? When there's no noise, the T is practically infinite. It's huge, okay? And when I go the other way, 
the T starts to get smaller and smaller. Okay? And so uh, I could tell you, though, what every one of these numbers means because we have that information. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take a look at the linear model table. Okay? So uh, uh, let's see. So the coefficients you understand, the coefficient column is just the regression formula for the best line. Okay, so you understand that already. Let's add a little more noise. Oh, let's, where's that sigma thing? I'm gonna add a little bit of noise. I kind of wish that these, uh, my little sliders would float around. Let's add just a little more noise. Maybe 0.5 will be good. Okay, so let's get back here. Okay, so we all understand that this is sort of the ordinary, uh, the intercepting coefficients from these squares. I had my little linear regression function and it computes these numbers. Oh, actually I want to, I, what I want to do, could, here it is. I'm gonna add some noise here actually. This is the, this is, this is the noise. Yeah, maybe this is the noise from the experiments that we're using. Okay, so, do, 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 do. Uh, so this is just the regression formula. You could see these numbers here that I calculated with my own built-in function are exactly the numbers here. Okay. So what is the standard error column? You might be wondering. Well, you remember I told you before that the statisticians had formulas for the exact standard deviation of the slope and the intercept, right? And I actually printed them for you. These were the exact formulas. Uh, we don't know sigma, so we don't get to use that. But we have an estimate from sigma, right? We have, this is an estimate. So let's go ahead and use that. Let's replace sigma with the estimate. Um, and so instead of using this formula where we don't have sigma, we're gonna use the estimate, the square root of the variance estimate. That'll be the estimate for the standard deviation. And so this will be our approximation to the standard deviation of the, uh, uh, of, of the intercept and look at that. That is exactly this number over here, right? There's something very satisfying when you can produce the same number, you know, yourself uh, rather than sort of a mysterious table, okay? Well, this is, this is exactly, this standard error is the estimated standard deviation in the coefficient of the intercept, okay? And then similarly, we had this formula for the slope, and you saw how well that worked. So let's use the estimate here. We're not gonna use sigma, we're gonna again use the, the estimated number 0.33, and sure enough, that is the number here. Okay, so these numbers are not so mysterious. These, in, out there in the real world, there's a true standard deviation to these coefficients, okay? And there is, we don't have that, but we can estimate them. We're actually, it, it's kind of a funny thing, we're actually using the distance from the line to kind of infer what the total noise was originally, right? Because somehow when you add noise to a problem, it shows itself in, up in part in the errors from the line. And so that's something you can use. This is something that statisticians use, okay? And of course, we're lucky enough to be able to do this because we're able to run Julia very, very fast get these 100,000 answers very quickly. So what is this T number? Actually, this T number is a very simple number. It's actually nothing other than the ratio of the first column to the second column. So the T column is simply the coefficient column divided by the STD error column. If you don't believe me here, I'll open up a cell and I'll actually take this number and divide it by this number. So you can see it with your own eyes. And you can see that that is this number here, minus 1.28, right? Or similarly, I could take this number. You see, I couldn't have pre-done this because it just got calculated now here. So I did this and I got 2.08, okay? So we, we now understand three columns, how they were arrived. This is the least, you know, you do the least squares line fit, you get a slope, you get it. This is the intercept and you get a slope. Okay, because we've ended random noise, there's a standard deviation and we don't know the exact one, but we could estimate it and we got this, okay? Take the first column divided by the second column and we get a T number, 
right? It's just divide. It's nothing other than divide by, okay? We get a T number. And this T number, as you started to notice, uh, it, you know, depending on how much noise you have, this may be small or large, and we're gonna make use of this. If when, the, when this number was large, you'll remember, you kind of believe your model better. When this T number was small, maybe you have less confidence, you know, that you, you feel that noise has taken over, right? So there's this T number. And let me mention that this T number is, also has a known distribution and it's called uh, the T distribution. Some of you may have actually heard of it being called the student T distribution. Um, the word student doesn't mean you're a student. It means it was the pseudonym of the mathematician or statistician who first played with this distribution. But this T distribution sounds kind of mysterious, I suppose. But in fact, um, if you want to generate uh, from this T distribution, it's very easy. Uh, you can generate from this distribution simply by taking a, a normalized standard normal and divide it by the square root of sums of squares of k more normals, right? So this is all the t distribution is. It's the it's the random number generated by this formula, and um, here you could see it for some different values of k. When k is three, the t distribution here is this red, and uh, by the way, the standard normal isn't that far away, right? Here's the standard normal. It's pretty close. So there's K is three. Um, when K is, you could, to be honest, I'm not sure people really need to know about the, the student T distribution anymore because most of the time these days we have so much data that the distance, I mean, I guess I could go beyond 20. It wouldn't take much here. Let's, let's, let's go beyond. I mean, I don't know how much more I would need, but um, I mean, look at it, it just fits so closely, the normal distribution that I, I get the feeling that, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a statistician, I suppose. I just play one on TV, I guess. But I get the feeling that the T distribution was more about an older world when uh, there was just so much less data than the modern world that we live in. I mean, maybe it's still relevant, I suppose it probably is, but it doesn't feel, it feels like we teach this stuff more from the past. But one could use, the, the truth is, as far as what I'm going to say, whether you use the T distribution or you just assume that the, the data is normal, it wouldn't even matter, I, I think, for most practical purposes. Um, so that leads us to the probability being greater than absolute value of T. So that, that, that next number in our table is literally the area of under this curve, whether it's the green or red curve, it doesn't matter much to me. It's, it's, it's theoretically the part under the red curve that is outside of the interval minus TT. Now, what is the meaning of that one? Well, basically the, the meaning is that it's somehow, it, it, it's kind of the probability that these coefficients could have actually had a good chance of including zero. What's the relevance of a zero coefficient? A zero coefficient means that there's no dependence. For example, a zero here means there's no dependence on Fahrenheit. A zero here means there's no intercept at all. In other words, a zero tells you that your model is kind of wrong or overstated. Like if there was a zero here, you should have just assumed that the centigrade was, was proportional to Fahrenheit only, right? Which of course we know is not true. A zero here means that the centigrade would always be constant, right? And of course, we know that not to be true. So the way a statistician would say that is we have, have a null hypothesis that we our null hypothesis is that these coefficients are zero. And um, we're happiest when we get to reject the null hypothesis uh, because that means that these numbers are significant and we can go ahead and use these computed numbers with a certain level of confidence. And so people often like to have you know 95, so I talked about it over here uh, that people like to have it with, you know, sometimes 99% confidence or 95 or 90% or confidence. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that, you know, people would want. Uh, so if we go back to our table and let's see here, we, um, let's see, if I go back to the table, um, we could see that for very large values of the noise, uh, 
these these no, I mean, it, you actually need a lot of noise, I guess, not to really believe these sorts of things. Uh, here, I mean, at, at here we 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 would accept the, the 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 hypothesis with probably ten to the minus ninety nine, right? In other words, we we surely will re, re reject it, okay? And then you could see increasing probabilities that you know we might accept we might accept the null hypothesis. Um, as we add more noise, obviously each time I run the experiment, I'll get a different, uh, I only have 10 data points. But for example, here, we are not quite at 90%, but it's, it's, it's big enough that you might want to re reject the hypothesis. Maybe 90% is even too strong because if you look at these coefficients, they're kind of crazy. But again, with 10 data points, it's, you know, nobody knows what to do. So uh, that's how you do these things. All right. Um, I don't know if I, the last little bit here, I've kind of used up my micro century, but maybe I'll just say one last thing about degrees of freedom, just because uh, people often find the concept of a degree of freedom mysterious and it, it plays a role. And so what I thought I would do is kind of show you the simplest degree of freedom, which is uh, how many degrees of freedom are there in a demeaned vector. So here, maybe I should actually have phrased it that way. I think I'm just gonna, so uh, maybe I'll put it here. Yeah, so how many degrees of freedom are in a demeaned vector of normals, right? And I thought I would sort of show you a cool experiment that kind of answers it right away. Here I take 10 normals and I demean it and I sum the squares. And I did this a million times. And you'll notice for 10, you get nine, right? Let's, let's see what the pattern is. Let's do it for five, you get four. For 100, you, know, you get 99-ish. And so um, my point here is if you ever wondered why the sample variance always has you dividing by n minus one, and not n, this is the crux of the reason. Okay, and I'll kind of leave it a little bit mysterious, but I'll just leave it at that. That it's this n minus one that you get. Yeah, let's do 17, we should get about 16. It's this, it's, it's this, it's this is the reason because in the end, one of the degrees of freedom gets absorbed into sort of the data. And then this is the amount that sort of gets left in the variance. All right, I think that will end today's lecture. If you missed the beginning, let me remind you that on Wednesday, um, we're this is only for the MIT students. Uh, out there on the internet, you won't see any change. We are not going to be using Zoom. Uh, we are going to be instead using StreamYard. And so, uh, you know, the, for the MIT folks, I'll make sure to get the information out by Piazza. Um, I'll put it on the canvas. Uh, possibly I'll send a few emails to remind you. So hopefully nobody will be confused. All right, so let me say goodbye out there to everybody, um, and we will see you next Wednesday. Okay. And Dave, if you can uh, turn